Today we're going to be continuing in our teaching series uh, called Crazy Faith, and so if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to open it to the book of Ruth. We're going to uh, read from the first chapter and a little bit from the fourth chapter. Um, and as you're turning there, I, I want to make a few comments uh, about the, uh, the Supreme Court decision that came down this, this week. Um, uh, so uh, today we're going to continue our teaching series called Crazy Faith. Um, in fact, we're actually going to look at how relational loyalty within the family of God uh, may look like crazy faith on the outside. And uh, for some, after this week, um, once again, that unity within our church and that relational loyalty stands to be tested. So I want to talk to you briefly about the news this week, um, about the Dobbs case that was recently before the Supreme Court, which um, overturns both Roe versus Wade and um, a more recent decision, Planned Parenthood v. Casey. This decision states that uh, the two previously mentioned decisions, uh, which became the legal basis for tens of millions of abortions, was wrongly decided. Uh, it means laws governing abortion will now be decided locally, state by state. The citizens, through their elected representatives, will now be free to form laws around abortion, some states which will outlaw it, and other states like ours which have chosen to codify abortion right up to the moment of birth. So how should Christians respond to this news? First, we should rejoice over what is good. As I have said before, it is a moral good when fewer babies die. That is neither complicated nor needs any nuance. It is a moral good. You know, millions of Christians, Jews, and Muslims, uh, and others have labored billions of collective hours through prayer and work and advocacy to see this decision come to pass. The 1973 Roe v. Wade decision led, has led to the murder of over 63 million babies. Let that sink in. That's a fifth of the U.S. population as it stands. A grave dis disproportion of those babies were girls and people of color. And that should grieve us. It certainly grieves God. So as a church that worships the author of life, whose own son died so that we might live, we should thank God when fewer babies die. Second, we must acknowledge, out of love, the emotions surrounding this decision. Most Christians will rejoice but some of you may be feel, maybe feel confused or angry. Some of you may worry that women's rights are being eroded, and others may think that that concern is unfounded. We are required to be compassionate toward all people, not just the people who agree with us, not just the people who vote like us. Compassionate towards all people. Ephesians commands us to be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Now, perhaps the issue of abortion makes you feel angry, or perhaps the present ruling on it does. We would all do well to remember that when we are angry, we are less rational. And when we are angry, compassion is much more difficult. This is why the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in the church is so important, and the Spirit lives in me and in you and can help us in this moment. However, we must beware our own empathy. The scriptures teach us that empathy cannot drive ethics. Only God's word can. While we feel deep compassion, and we must feel deep compassion, we must not let our feelings drive us to distort what God says clearly. Unborn humans bear the image of God, and unborn humans are humans still. And killing unborn God image bearers is a sin the Bible calls murder. Now, perhaps some of you will say that this court case is not a victory because this one ruling fails to deal with so many other issues. And that's true. It does not deal with many other issues. This is a Supreme Court ruling on one case and therefore can only deal, presumably, with the facts of that case. Yet there still are important issues, issues of life and of justice to address. This decision leaves unaddressed the holes in our medical and social services that make abortion a tempting choice. It leaves unaddressed the economic issues that leave some in a cycle of poverty. It leaves unaddressed the torn social fabric in our society that has thinned out the connections with family, church, and community. It leaves unaddressed our culture's obsession with sex on demand as a form of recreation or the performance of one's identity rather than a most sacred act of covenantal love reserved for the safety and sanctity of marriage. 
Most of all, it leaves unaddressed the one glaring issue that makes abortion seem plausible in the first place, and it's one I feel particularly passionate about, bad men. Bad men use women. They use them for sexual pleasure. They impregnate them and leave them to fend for themselves. Bad men rape and abuse women that God has demanded they lead and protect. Bad men act like little boys, treating women abusively. And this ruling doesn't deal with harsher penalties that such men absolutely deserve. And this ruling does not absolve the church of Jesus Christ of the responsibility of discipling our men to be better men, demanding, and we do demand it in this house, demanding that they treat women as gifts from God, not as things to be used. The answer for such toxic imitations of masculinity is neither abortion nor the abolition of masculinity, but courageous, holy, Christ-like masculinity. This court decision does not, indeed it cannot deal with these things. These things are still left to us, to the church. Yet it is irrational to suggest that one part of a moral good is invalid on the grounds that it leaves out the other parts. No moral improvement could be accomplished if we could not take, take steps to get to a better place. To say, you cannot become better here unless you become better everywhere, would doom us to moral improvement precisely nowhere. Third, we must, family, we must offer grace. I don't know all of your pasts. So I will not and cannot assume that abortion has not somehow affected you or touched your life. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ shows us that God has grace and mercy for those who have performed abortions, for women who have received them, for men who have demanded them, and for all of us who participate in a culture that embodies such a wicked sexual ethic that makes abortion plausible in the first place. We Christians are not better we are not better. We have just been graciously allowed to see, and my Bible still says grace is a gift so that no one can boast. Let us therefore be as gracious as we are clear, especially in this moment. Listen to me, spiking the ball, whether on social media or in our circle of friends, is not gracious. And neither is blindly venting rage. Fourth, we must be faithful. Jesus' people are to be marked by faithfulness to God and to each other. Faithfulness in advocating for laws to protect our most vulnerable neighbors. Faithfulness in caring for the preborn and their mothers and fathers. Faithfulness in operating hundreds of pregnancy resource centers around the country. Faithfulness in adopting and fostering and in ensuring that every child has a safe, permanent, and loving home. Faithfulness in proclaiming the good news of the gospel to women who've had abortions, men who've demanded abortions, and the people who've performed them. Fifth, we church must stand firm. This is a spiritual battle. Can you feel it? And just so you know, hell is angry. You and I, therefore, must be prayerful and ready to give a clear account for your ethic of life from the scriptures. In fact, we are going to be very soon hosting um, an, an event whereby we, we talk about that, and you're welcome to, to sign up for that, where we're going to equip you and, and explain and explore that biblical ethic of life. We are ready, willing, and able to help in this regard. Sixth, we must continue to learn our worldview from the Bible and not from any other source. We are the people of God. We are the people of his words. We therefore learn our ethics not from social media, not the political right or left, not from our emotions, not even from our favorite narratives. Jesus said, the truth will set you free. Not your truth will set you free. Not your experience will set you free. Not a policy will set you free, nor the judgment of any court of the land will set you free. We must continue to commit to learning the truth of the scriptures as they are the only sure guide to faith and life. Seventh, we must continue to make the biblical ethic of life practical. And I have to say, as your pastor, I'm very, very grateful for the way that you do. I'm proud of you. And I don't mean that in a, in a sort of paternalistic way. I'm deeply gratified to be part of this spiritual family. You, this church, help us partner with Orphan Network 
to feed and to clothe and provide medical care for and give the gospel to hundreds of children each year in Nicaragua. You, the church, help us raise money for the Boston Center for Pregnancy Choices to provide emotional and medical care for women facing unplanned pregnancies. You, this church, have helped us pay off millions of dollars in medical debt in this very county, which keeps people in the cycle of poverty. You, this church, continue to stand with foster families through Fostering Hope and support the social institutions that place children in loving families. Many of those loving families are families in this church. You, this church, continue to forge relationships with local schools and support the work they're doing to teach truth and equip the next generation. You, this church, meet thousands of each other's needs every single week in your small groups that we don't ever get to even hear about as staff. You, the church, care for the aged and infirm in our midst. You very often live out a culture and ethic of life. Can we do more? Always. Always. But it cannot be said of this church that we somehow care politically for some issue, but not practically for life. Not of you. And I'm grateful for that. We must not fall for the false choice of caring for women or for babies. We do not have to decide to care for the unborn or the born. And anyone who suggests that we do have to decide is lying to you. And they're not telling you the truth. As I've said before, pitting women against children is a demonic, false dichotomy. It's a choice we do not have to make. We can care for human life, whole human lives, all of it, to an increasingly faithful degree because humans bear the image of God. We therefore commit to love the image of God in the unborn, the young, the old, the rich, the poor, the black, the brown, the white, the right, the left, and everybody else. We love people because God first loved us. Finally, we must continue to trust God. God is sovereign over history and he is good. And I pray that he would find us faithful in this moment and in all the difficult cultural moments to come when the issue is something else, and they will come. They will come. And as we trust God, we must not let any news, any court, any politician, any emotion, any fear, or any story tear the church of Jesus Christ apart. That would be grievous. Jesus himself said what God has joined together. Let no one, no one pull us under. Staying together, remaining relationally unified as an ethnically diverse, economically diverse, generationally diverse, and politically diverse church will take some crazy faith, y'all. It's going to take faith. It's very easy to go to church, but it takes crazy faith to be the church. And our call isn't to simply go. Our call is to be the church of Jesus Christ. Yet I am confident of this. If we choose to trust God, enough to remain together, our relational God will bless us. And friends, he must bless us. The world around us needs, needs him. And we are the appointed vessels through whom they will know his mercy and grace. So whatever else we do from this moment, whether it's in person or on social media or however else we interact, let us do so as the people of God. Because God and his mercy is the only hope for this nation. Can we pray for our nation in this moment? God, we love you. We do not put our hope in courts or presidents or senators or representatives or politicians. Some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We're grateful for the good, and we see very clearly the work ahead. Father, I pray for your mercy and your grace to come and cover our nation. Lord, what we deserve is your judgment. For, for what we've done to each other, not just with this issue, but with so many others, we deserve your wrath. But you have been merciful, and we're asking you to be merciful still. We're asking for the winds of renewal and revival to blow across our land. Lord, as we learn that the only safe place to put faith and hope and trust is in Jesus. We ask that you'd do this in us and through us in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Now to the book of Ruth. Ruth 1, 
1 to 18, and then Ruth 4, we'll read a few verses at the end. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and then lived there about ten years. And both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return to the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and had given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May, <clears throat> may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for that is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your daughter, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I'll die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Now, at the end of this book, we read this, after all of the events. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. His father, he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, please help us as we study. Would you enable and empower my words to be your words? And would you open ears and take blinders off eyes and soften hearts to see what must be seen from your word? We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I cannot imagine what it would be like to simply lose my children. I can't imagine to be in Naomi's situation where, where my, my, my spouse and then my children passed away. As, as I mentioned, I got to, I got to spend uh, the last week and a half or so with my, with my eldest daughter, uh, Alana, and we got, to, we got to go to the Philippines together. And, and as I was preparing this message for you, I, I just imagine, okay, imagine now if I'd come home and my wife were not there, but had passed away, and my daughter and my second daughter and both of my sons were all gone. I, I cannot imagine the despair, the darkness, the, the angst of soul I would feel. I, I, I do know this, though, that if I were feeling that way, if, if I were feeling overwhelmed by, by a sense of loss, by a sense of darkness, the very last thing that I would want would also be the very thing that I most needed, which would be relationship with spiritual family. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that when you don't feel particularly good, when you feel like you've been through something really hard, you know you need the people of God, but there's something inside of you that's like, absolutely not, leave me alone. Right? Is that just me? I'm asking for a friend. Um, a friend named Shmadam Shmabry. Um, yeah. 
So, so here's, here's Naomi, and she's been through something really difficult. And when, when we've gone through something really difficult, somehow that means, uh, it, it feels like it makes our relationships kind of flexible. We, we live in a moment right now of, let's call it rental relationships. Some of you, you rent an apartment, and, and if you do, uh, you, you know that one of the best things about that is that when things are broken or not working, you call the landlord, right. We, we had this great apartment uh, when we first moved here. We lived there for three or four years. It was us, and the Fishers lived up here, and it was great. We had a great relationship with our landlord, and it was a lot of fun, and whenever anything bad happened in the apartment, all I had to do was call the landlord, and then it got fixed. And then by God's grace, we bought a place. And you know, when I called my landlord, he said, good luck, <laughs> right? Because now I'm the landlord. Now I own the problem. When you own relationships, you own the problems too. But we treat relationships as rentals because we are in a highly mobile city. People move here and then pe people move from here. And so we sometimes create relationships not as owners, not as people who are invested in the emotional and spiritual well-being of each other. We rather rent relationships because we happen to live nearby one another and go to the same, I don't know, church. You're nearby, you'll do. And that's how we treat one another. And in the face of a culture like that, and in the face of a culture like that who, you know, when we experience hard stuff, we have this story of Ruth who demonstrates, amongst many things, crazy relational loyalty. Ruth shows us, amongst many things, that sometimes relational loyalty is what crazy faith looks like. Sometimes saying yes to relationships inside the church, within the people of God, is what crazy faith looks like. But here's what I have to tell you. When crazy faith looks like relational loyalty, our relational God always blesses that. When crazy faith, when, when your ultimate belief in God manifests itself as relational loyalty to the people of God, God always blesses that. And I can't think of much that's more countercultural right now, especially when we tend to build relationships out of affinity and agreement. And in the people of God, that's not so. Now here, when, when Ruth is loyal to Naomi, it, it looks crazy. For her, crazy faith looked like covenant loyalty because, well, on paper, Ruth should have gone somewhere else. I mean, let, let's review the story. Naomi... Uh, moves with her husband out of the land of Israel. Already we have a problem. Not necessarily Naomi's fault, but definitely her husband's fault. That things get hard in the church within the people of God. So my man moves out of the land of Israel and into the land of Moab, which, if you're at all familiar with your Bible, is where the bad guys live, okay? It's, that's, not, that's not the place you want to be. Now, back in the day, moving wasn't just like, oh, we moved, you know, towns because we found a different house. No, no. Moving meant moving away from this God and moving into the people of another deity altogether. So moving was an act of unfaithfulness. I mean, God had given them this land, and just because things got a little hard, my man moved his family. Side note, fathers, your decisions echo down to your children. That's a little bit of the Father's Day message I didn't get to preach to you last week, but you're welcome. <laughs> Naomi's husband makes the decision to move his whole family out from the people of God, and then his sons marry pagan women, which was like a double no-no within the people of God. For, for Israelite men to marry, or Israelite anybody's, to marry people who didn't worship and follow the God of the Old Testament was a grievous error according to Old Testament law. And eventually, this man and his sons died. And for, for Naomi, this was, this was a huge problem. If, if my wife and children died, that would be a huge problem emotionally. But for Naomi, it was not only a huge problem emotionally, it was also a huge problem economically and in terms of her personal security. Right? She was a single, poverty-stricken woman in the land that hated where she was from. 
So she hears that there's food back in Israel. There'd been a famine. It's now over. So she moves back. She says, okay, to her, to her two daughters-in-law, I'm, I'm, I'm moving back, but like, you guys go home. Like, I, I love you. God bless you. But like, look, you're not going to wait around for me to have more sons. Go back to the Go back to the families that you came from and, and may you find peace in the houses of your future husbands, is what she says. And, and the Bible says they lifted up their voice and wept. And you, you need to hear that in like, they, they ugly cried. It was, it was terribly sad. One of her daughters-in-law leaves because that's what made sense. But Ruth didn't. Ruth said No. I'm not leaving you. In fact, may it be done to me more so, even more severely, if anything but death parts me from you. Naomi, your God is now my God. Your people are my people. Where you go, I'm going. Where you stay, I'm staying. And that's the end of it. On paper, that does not make sense. You need to understand that when you choose to be relationally loyal to the people of God, on paper, it might not make sense. Outside, your relationships might look at you and say, look, but you could have a better opportunity somewhere else, or you could have more freedom somewhere else, or you could have, you know, easier relationships somewhere else. That's very common. We call it the five to seven year itch. Most marriages end within years five and seven because they get the five to seven year itch. Most friendships end within the years five to seven, and most people who end up leaving church do so within years five to seven. Do you know why? I shall tell you. Because after five to seven years, living with another human with a face and a pulse, which is most of us, you've gotten hurt enough to make a solid case to yourself about why you should leave this person. And the reality is, you're not wrong. Because that person that you're in relationship with is a person and people, ugh. I mean, have you met one? My goodness. And so... So, I mean, Ruth, it made no sense for her to stay. She had all of the security back home where she was from, in the country she was from, like knowing the systems that she knew and the people that she knew, like that was home, that was safe, that was familiar. But something must have leaked out about Israel's God. That's the only sense I can make of this. At some point, Naomi or her former husband or former um, father-in-law, somebody started telling Ruth about the stories of God. The story of Moses, the story of the Exodus, all the stories of Abraham and the miracles. And, and, and at some point, Ruth must have begun to put together the God these people worship is very different from the gods of Moab. And she couldn't have been more correct. The God of Israel is radically different from the gods of Moab. The gods of Moab demand child sacrifice for personal security. The God of Israel ends up giving his own child to eternally secure his people. The God of, gods of Moab are, demand constant uh, fealty and slavery from the people of Moab so that the gods can live in luxury. But the God of Israel gives Sabbath to the greatest and the least. So at some point, something must have turned it in her. And she ends up being relationally loyal to Naomi. And in her relational loyalty, she's actually being faithful to God. Listen, sometimes crazy faith looks like relational loyalty. It certainly did for Ruth, and what Ruth got for it was absolute, absolutely amazing. Ruth's faith seemed crazy because it looked like covenant loyalty. And she ends up saying this thing, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your gods are going to be my gods. Your people are going to be my people. And the rest of the story is amazing. When crazy faith looks like relational loyalty, our relational God always, 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 always blesses it. Do you know why? Because God is relational. You know that, right? God doesn't like relationships. He is relational, just like you are alive. God is fundamentally, as part of his nature, relationship. He, he is the one God who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's nature is infinite and eternal good relationship. And so when we act out faithfulness in relationship, when we are loyal to the people of God and faithful to the people of God, we act like God looks. And he likes that. And so Naomi get, gets blessed and Ruth gets absolutely blessed. God rewards Ruth's faithless to Naomi 
because it ended up being faithfulness to him. What, what ends up happening? Well, Ruth moves back to uh, Israel with her mother-in-law, and she starts to work hard. She ends up working hard not only for herself, but for Naomi. She ends up going out, and, and she gleans for food. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with Old Testament law, gleaning uh, was sort of the Old Testament's welfare um, laws, so that if, uh, if you owned a field, the law of the Old Testament would say, look, when you harvest your field, don't harvest all of it. Harvest most of it, but leave the edges so that those who are poor may come and work for their own bread and therefore have the dignity of work and also have their needs met, right? Pretty cool idea. So Naomi comes and, and Ruth comes and Ruth ends up working really hard for her own needs and for the needs of her mother and ends up doing so in the field of a man named Boaz. The Bible gives one of the highest compliments it can give to this man. It calls him a man of valor and calls Ruth a woman of valor. These, these are like big flashing lights in, in the Old Testament about how great this man and this woman were. And Boaz ends up loving Ruth. But, but there's a problem. There's the problem of the kinsman redeemer. Now, kinsman redeemer was another law in the Old Testament which had to do with like social safety and social security. It went like this. If the men in a woman's life died in order to not lose her lineage nor her property and make sure she and her, her future potential progeny were taken care of, the nearest male relative would bring her into his family to preserve her, her husband's name, and their children and their stuff. So it was the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer to do so. And so Boaz has a problem because there's another near kinsman redeemer, but being faithful in relationships is difficult, and this gentleman did not wish to do so. So Boaz ends up saying, I'll be the kinsman redeemer. He ends up marrying Ruth and bringing her into his household. And then Ruth is given children. And this child ends up being King David's grandfather. And Ruth ends up being the great far off grandmother of King Jesus. Now that sounds awesome, right? But in the moment of Ruth's relational loyalty, she didn't get to read the end of her own book. She didn't know it was going to go. She didn't know that this, oh, this is going to be awesome, and eventually I get to be related to Jesus. Sweet. Let's go, Naomi. No, she didn't know that at all. All she knew was that I think what I've heard of the God of the Bible leads me to believe that I should be faithful in this relationship. And that took crazy faith. Listen, we studied crazy faith for deliverance. Hallelujah. Crazy faith for what you need, praise God. Crazy faith to get through a difficult moment. And that's all really important. But sometimes, sometimes, crazy faith, especially in a culture like ours, especially in a moment like ours, especially in a society like ours, crazy faith looks like saying yes to relationships in church and not going when they get hard. Not leaving when they get difficult. Not piecing out when you find out, oh my God, people in here vote differently than me. <gasps> Someone get me some pearls to clutch. <laughs> what do you mean people in here aren't exactly like me in every way? You'd be surprised how shocked people are constantly by that revelation. Or maybe you wouldn't be. Depends on how long you've been here. <laughs> when crazy faith looks like relational loyalty, our relational God always rewards it because he is relational. And for Ruth, the deciding factor wasn't the fact that she worked hard, though she did, nor her birthright, because she had none. It was her faith in God that looked like relational loyalty to Naomi. Sometimes, friends, faith just, we, can we be honest? We get real spiritual, more spiritual than God. Like, are you believing God? Mm, yes, brother. And we do this. I don't know why we do this. Shoulders get high, eyes get closed, kind of lean the head back. Mm. Like we just smelled something nice, but are acting weird about it. Mm. And we get real spiritual. Oh, yes, brother. It's always brother. Yes, brother. I'm just, I'm trusting the Lord, okay? Your trusting in the Lord should look like you being trustworthy with others. And if it doesn't look like that, then you're not trusting the Lord. You're just making strange faces. It's okay, I've done it too. I've gotten real spiritual, more spiritual than God. And I'm sure he looks at me and is like, I, what am I gonna do with you? Why are you making that face? When crazy faith looks like relational loyalty, our relational God always blesses it. He blessed Ruth's 
and he ended up doing more in that, those relationships than she possibly could have imagined. This pagan Moabite woman from the people who oppressed and hated Israel ends up being brought into not just the people of God, but ends up being in the family line of King Jesus. She never could have foreseen that. Listen, when I said yes to certain relationships, I never could have foreseen how blessed I would be. I remember looking at Donnie Fisher many years ago going, look, if you leave me, I'm coming too. I said the same thing to Hope. Same thing to Hope. Sometimes I'm like, look, we both hate that guy. Let's go. <laughs> but I had no idea in saying yes to certain covenant relationships that it would A, require, it would require faith sometimes, and B, the blessing that would come on the other side of that. My friends, when you exercise enough faith to make, remain relationally faithful, God will bless you because that's the kind of God that he is. And of course, this story just points us right to the faithfulness of the one that Naomi and Ruth were trusting in in the first place. Jesus was crazy faithful to his people, even when they were unfaithful, just like Ruth was faithful to Naomi, even though her husband had turned his back on the people of God. Jesus was crazy faithful to redeem us, even though we didn't deserve it, just like Boaz was faithful to redeem Ruth. And Jesus' relational loyalty to us looked crazy at the time it cost him the most. You kidding me? Jesus is getting the skin peeled off his back. He's the victim of a false trial. He's slowly dying an excruciating death. And then we bury him in a tomb. That's what his relational faithfulness looked like. It looked crazy. Yet his father and God rewarded his faith in ways we couldn't have even imagined. Not only with resurrection, but with a redeemed people who, if we trust in Jesus, our truer and better Boaz, our greater and more perfect Ruth, we will rise with him too. Relational faith and faithfulness takes crazy faith. But when we are faithful in these relationships, God rewards it. Most of all, when we are faithful in our relationship with Jesus. So I begin by saying, I, I, I can't imagine the despair I would feel if I were in if I were in Naomi's situation. But I can definitely imagine how when I am going through hard things, the last thing that I want is also one of the biggest things that I need, which is my spiritual family, which is the relational loyalty of the men and women of God. I wonder for you today, my friends, what it would look like to exercise crazy faith. May it, maybe it means staying in that marriage or going back to it. Maybe it means hanging in there with your kids, even though it's hard, or hanging in there with your parents. Maybe it means continuing to disciple this young man, even though you want to lay hands on him and throw him into traffic sometimes. <laughs> Again, speaking for a friend. <laughs> I got it. I know. Relationships are hard. Everything good is hard. Everything good is hard. But crazy faith, when it looks like relational loyalty, God always blesses it. He always blesses it. The question is, are we going to be faithful enough in our relationships to see the blessing? God, help us. Help us be faithful in our relationships. Lord, oh, the, the winds of culture and politics and all of that threaten so deeply to tear and pull at us. God, the winds of culture and politics feel like they, they, could, they could blow the church apart, but Lord, I thank you. Your word says you keep those in perfect peace whose minds and eyes and hearts and faith are stayed on you. And so God, I thank you, Lord, not only that in this political and cultural moment you're gonna keep our church together, but Lord, through us, as we exercise crazy faith to remain faithful, Lord, you are going to do something beautiful and even more miraculous still. God, you're going you're to keep us together and through us, Father, you're going to bless the world around us.